So what I have here is my design for a Game Boy Multicart. A Multicart is just a cartridge that has more than one game on it, and with this board you can switch games by cycling power to the Game Boy, or by pressing the button in the center of the board, or both, depending on how you configure uh, the board to behave based on these switches here. For this build, it's an Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons multi-cart. I got the label printed from Matthew Mods on Etsy. And you can change the game by pressing the button in the middle. Um, and if you press it while you're playing, the game will automatically reset back to the Game Boy Color uh, splash screen. So I'll show it off here. Um, pressing the button, it feels similar to an EverDrive, if you've ever played um, games on an EverDrive. It's not easy to bump accidentally, but it's also not hard to press it. So you don't have to worry about hitting it accidentally while you're playing a game. And you don't have to worry about pressing too hard on the cartridge. So here is uh, Oracle of Ages. Now if I want to change the game, all I have to do is press in right here. It sends it back to the splash screen here. Now this should be Oracle of Seasons. Now the way I have this one configured, uh, the game does not change when you cycle power. Um, this way, the game will remember what which game you were last playing. So if I turn it off and then turn it back on, it'll boot back into Oracle of Seasons. I think this will be the default way um, most people make games with the multi-cart. Um, but if there's some reason you want to change games every time you reset the system, every time you turn off power, um, then you can do that too. It uh, all depends on you know what your needs are. So I have two different Game Boy multi-cart boards to choose from, the MBC3 multi-cart and the MBC5 multi-cart. And uh, depending on which games you want to make, will determine which board you have to use. The Oracle games use MBC5, so that board was an MBC5 board. Um, but for this video, I'll be going over the MBC3 multi-cart. I'm going to be making a Pokemon Gold and Silver multi-cart. It's going to change games with only a button press, and it will reset the Game Boy when pressed as well, just like the Oracle multi-cart I just showed off. Now the process for making both of these multi-carts is pretty much the same, just the only difference is some of the parts you have to use. Um, so you can still follow along with this video if you're making an NBC 5 one. Now one other option for these boards is uh, the save data. So you can have a dedicated save or uh, shared save data across both games. So this Oracle multi-cart has the one megabit chip in here for the SRAM. That means that each game will have its own save file, which makes sense because Oracle games, um, you can't share save data across the versions like that. Um, they're not compatible with each other. But um, Pokemon games, on the other hand, you can have the same save data for both versions and it'll still work. So if you see on the, uh, the SRAM socket here, there's a smaller section for the 256K SRAM. It fits right there. And so if you use 256K, then the save data will be shared across both games. Now the functional benefit from that is so I can just capture version exclusive Pokemon without having to trade between versions. Um, but if I did set up with the one megabit uh, SRAM chip, then I would have separate save files. So to recap, this is going to be a Pokemon Gold and Silver multi-cart with shared save data that only changes games um, when you press the button on the cartridge. And uh, at the end of the video, I'll show you a fun little extra feature of this board that I added specifically for Pokemon games. Before I start the build though, I will say that if you're planning to make one of these yourself, you absolutely must read through the GitHub repository that I've written. I'm not going to cover absolutely everything about these boards in this video, so you will need to rely on the written instructions as well. It's very comprehensive, I spent hours writing it. Um, you can even just close this video if you wanted to and follow the written guide, uh, but then of course you'll miss out on my dulcet tones. Uh, and also, this video should be a good companion to making regular uh, single MBC1, MBC3, or MBC5 games. And I have repositories for all of those as well. The boards are pretty similar, so the process will be mostly applicable to those boards. Um, there will be some differences, but the general gist will be the same. Okay, so anyway, to pull this off, um, I'll need to get a few things first. Um, obviously, the first thing I'll need is one of these circuit boards. Um, I do have the files for these on GitHub, 
um, for you to freely use and order from board manufacturers in case you want a different color um, from the ones I'm selling. I usually sell black um, just because it's kind of a universal color. Um, but project is open source, so you know, do what you want. Um, secondly, I'll need a bunch of parts um, that I bought off of Mauser. Um, or DigiKey. I use Mauser usually. Um, they all come in these bags. There's a bill of materials section on the GitHub. Uh, this is where the bulk of the cost is going to come from. The new parts themselves aren't too bad, um, but one of the problematic parts are these uh, flash chips. You can only get these from AliExpress. Um, and they, at the time of this video, they're usually five to ten dollars each. Um, they're 29F033 chips. Um, and there's not really a great way of getting them. Like, you have to get them from AliExpress or eBay, but there's not really a reputable seller of them. You just kind of have to find a seller with decent ratings because they're all old parts. Um, and sometimes they can come in defective, so I would recommend getting a few extra just in case. Um, there are some other, uh, on my other carts, I use some smaller chips. Um, these, they're a bit bigger. Fit, they're physically bigger, but the size um, for the, the data is smaller. Um, those are only about a dollar or two on AliExpress, um, but since you're putting two games on one cartridge, you need the bigger ROM space. So I don't use those on these cards. Another part that you won't find on Mauser or DigiKey is the button in the middle of the cart for switching games. The only ones that I could find on those sites had too short of stems, uh, which means you wouldn't be able to press it when it was in the shell. The longer ones that fit perfectly in the shell so that you can press it down, you can only find on sites like AliExpress or eBay and sometimes Amazon, but Amazon's usually way overpriced. The specific height of the switch is 3.5 millimeters tall, and usually you'll find the correct part by searching 5.2 by 5.2 millimeter tactile switch. And again, make sure that you get the 3.5 millimeter tall option. I've got some more info in the GitHub on how to find the correct switch, so please read that through too. The third thing I'll need is a donor cartridge uh, for the mapper chip. So for Pokemon Gold and Silver, I need an MBC3 donor. I have the gold, uh, Japanese gold version. Got it for a few bucks um, and a lot from J4U. Um, the Japanese games usually go for cheaper. Um, don't use like an American Pokemon Gold. You don't have to use Pokemon Gold to make Pokemon Gold uh, cartridge. You can use um, one popular option is Mary Kate Nashley Pocket Planner kind of like the meme game everyone picks to make these games with. Um, so you need the NBC3 chip here. Um, I've got like a retro video game store a few minutes from my house that I go to sometimes for donors. They're like two, three bucks for junk games. So um, you can just get one of those uh, to use the chips from. There is a list um, on a website that I link to on GitHub. Um, so you can look through and find which games use the MBC3 chip, or MBC5 if you're making the MBC5 multi-cart. Um, and also note that these donor cartridges have to be legitimate copies. You can't use some bootleg, because um, the bootlegs don't use the original chips, they use bootleg chips. Um, it's also important to note that the revision of the MBC3 will determine the current draw, and that will determine your battery life. Um, I have a table on the GitHub that has current measurements for every MBC3 version, and you can tell the version, if you look at the number under here, oh, it's not focusing, it's BU3632K, um, that's one of the lower current models. The ones you want to avoid um, are the P2 revisions. The P2 revisions have a lot higher current draw for whatever reason, um, so your batteries, your save battery is going to last a lot less longer with those chips. And uh, a lot of people will ask me why I don't use FRAM instead of SRAM, um, because you don't need a battery for FRAM. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. I have them listed on my GitHub. I have a whole section on, on these GitHubs about why I stick with SRAM. Um, but the main reason is just that the SRAM chips are newly manufactured and they're easily available and they're only a few dollars. Um, and they're easier to implement into these designs. So um, I just stick with SRAM. You can't use FRAM on these boards, unfortunately.
And so we'll also need a way to solder all these components onto the board and a way to remove the MBC3 chip from the donor board. Um, for this video, I'll be using this Miniware hot plate to remove the chip um, from the donor. And also for the initial assembly of the cartridge um, using this solder paste. Um, and then after everything is on there, I will be going over with some flux and a soldering iron to clear up any bridges or missing solder joints. Um, because I, I don't think I'll be able to get them all in one pass with just the paste um, on the fine pitch parts. Um, this is not, you know, the only way to do this. It kind of depends on your skills, your preferences, and what equipment you have. This is just what I use. Um, so don't think this is gospel. It's just how I do it. Um, you will need some decent soldering skills to pull this off. Um, because you probably will have to drag solder a bit. Um, so you have to be confident. Um, this might be a good project to get practice with soldering, but maybe start out with one of the more basic boards I have, um, because these boards have, you know, they're not as cramped as these boards. These boards have a lot more parts. Um, so you could start with one of these, um, or just a practice kit. There's plenty of practice kits out there um, that you can get uh, practice with drag soldering and, you know, um, surface mount soldering without having to kill any old components. Um, from donor cartridges. Um, so I recommend doing that if you don't have enough experience soldering yet. Finally, you'll also need some kind of way of programming the cartridge. Um, for my purposes, I'll be using a GBX cart. Uh, this is a terrific tool. Um, I highly recommend getting one. I use it to back up save data and dump ROM files from original games, um, as well as you know flash new games. It's just very well supported. Um, it's not that expensive. It's just a very good tool to have. Um, and I guess technically you'll also need like a shell and a sticker, but I'll leave that part up to you. Okay, so let's get assembly. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take the MBC3 mapper chip off of the donor board. And uh, my board has a battery, yours probably also has a battery. Um, so if it does, you probably wanna take that off before you use the hot plate. So you can just use a soldering iron um, because you want to minimize the amount of heat that goes into the battery. So now just put the board on the hot plate, wait for it to heat up, and then once the solder is molten, you can gently take the mapper chip off. You don't want to force it off with your tweezers. Uh, you want to wait for the solder to completely melt so that you can just nudge it uh, freely. If you try to move the part off of the board before the joints are melted, then uh, the pins that haven't melted yet will kind of stick to the pads, um, which will bend them and then be really annoying to deal with later and make soldering the part um, on the new board way more difficult. Now I'll turn off the hot plate because the next steps uh, will take a while to finish and I'm not gonna need the hot plate for a while. So before I start on the new board, um, first thing you have to do is tape over the cart edge pins with capped on tape. This way, um, I know I can't get any stray solder onto these pins on the cart edge. It's not strictly a death sentence if you get some on there, but it's going to greatly reduce the longevity of your cartridges and potentially gum up your cart connector. So it, it really is not recommended to use carts with solder on the cart edge. If I got solder on the cart edge myself while making a game, I would just throw out that board and start over with a new one. So now I'm going to start putting down solder paste on the board. I use a 6337 T5 solder paste in a syringe. I'm going to put a link in the description for the exact kind I use, um, but there's many options out there and you kind of just have to find the type you like. One thing that's really handy to have if you're planning on making a lot of these boards is a solder paste stencil, uh, which is just a sheet of metal with holes where the solder paste is supposed to go on the circuit board. Using a stencil will get you really even amounts of paste exactly where you need to put them on the board. Um, it won't go on the solder mask at all. But I'm cheap and I'm not really planning on making more than a handful of these. So I'm just doing it all manually. If you're doing it manually, like I am, you just have to put down a little bit on each of the pads. And then for the pads on the parts that are fine pitch, like the EEPROM, um, I just usually put a thin line of solder across all the pads near the outside of the footprint. Once you heat it up with the hot plate, the solder paste is going to wick up on the metallic surfaces um, and off of the solder mask. So just make sure you generally keep to the ends of the pins 
with the paste if you're gonna put it on in a line like this. Um, so you don't trap any solder balls underneath the chips and it should go okay. Note that I don't put any solder paste down for the battery because I'm gonna be soldering that on last with an iron um, after I verify the cartridge works, again, to just minimize the heat going into the battery. I also saved the crystal oscillator X1 until the very end to do this by hand because there's a little cutout in the board and I don't want the component touching the hot plate either. If you're making a cart that doesn't need a real-time clock, you won't need that X1 crystal or even have to solder in R2, C2, or Z1. Uh, but since Pokemon Gold and Silver do use a real-time clock, I'm going to need these components. Now that the paste is down, I just referenced the bill of materials that I have in the GitHub for the exact components to place down on the board. Take note to put the larger parts on the correct way, the polarized ones. There should be pin one indicators on all of them and then pin one indicators on the board as well. The resistors and capacitors and the crystal oscillator and all the passive parts are not polarized, so you don't have to worry about the direction that you put those in. All right, now it's time for the fun part. Um, before I use my hot plate, I'm going to turn my fume extractor fan on so I don't breathe in all the fumes coming off of the board. I just put the board on the hot plate, center it up, and then turn it on and wait for it to heat up. You'll be able to see the solder start to melt and wick up on the pins as the temperature gets high enough. And you might see some resistors and capacitors flip up on one edge. This is called tombstoning. Um, but if you get some parts sticking up like that and they don't correct themselves, you're just gonna have to nudge them back down with uh, your tweezers onto the pads. Once the components have uh, nice looking solder joints, you just have to move the board around or move the uh, hot plate around to tackle all the other joints on the board. If you're gonna use a hot plate, you'll also need to make sure the larger components are centered properly on the pads. And so the pins aren't in between pads um, because then you'll be shorting out a lot of signals. This is a little tricky sometimes to get centered properly. Um, so sometimes what I'll do is tack down one of the legs and the corners with solder first so that I know it's centered um, before I start using the hot plate. Um, but you just have to do, it, do what's easiest for you. Now that that's all taken care of, I'm gonna be going around the board and checking for any solder bridges or missing solder connections on the legs. Generally, um, at this point, I usually just put down some flux on the mapper chip, the RAM, the EEPROM, and then the smaller multi-leg chips and do quick drags with my iron just to be safe. So here's a little bit of a life hack for you. The most recent tube of flux I got didn't have a fine point needle uh, for easy application or I lost it. Um, so if, you know, if you're in this situation, you can just kind of put it on and then use a through hole resistor lead to spread it around the board on the uh, other chips so you don't waste any flux. And I'm not intending this video to be a soldering tutorial at all. Um, there are a lot of other videos out there that do a way better job than I would at explaining technique. Um, but there's a few tips I can give you to keep in mind while you're doing this. One tip I have is that whenever you go to drag solder, make sure that your tip is clean of any solder before you start, get it all off of there because the paste that's on the board almost certainly has enough solder to finish the joints um, and usually will have too much in most cases. As you can see on my board, there's a lot of bridges, especially on the EEPROM. You'll be surprised by how little solder paste is necessary to get a good joint. So you don't wanna be adding extra solder on there with, um, with your iron. Two is that you want to use a wide tip for drag soldering rather than a fine point tip. I personally use a pretty big K tip for everything I do. So the reason you're gonna want to have a wider tip here is that it will do a better job at distributing solder across multiple pins while you drag your iron. Solder isn't going to flow from a hot pin to a cold pin. Um, so you need to have a wide tip to ensure that neighboring pins are heated as you drag along with your iron so that the solder distributes properly. Thirdly, don't do what I'm doing here. Uh, don't tilt the board up while you solder. Keep it flat on a table. I only did this to make it look better for the video. Now that the soldering is largely done, we need to configure the board for the number of games we want, the number of separate SRAM banks we want, and the method of switching games.
For this board, I used little dip switches here, but you can also use solder bridges instead to save a few bucks. To figure out what positions the switches need to go in, just check out the GitHub, which has two tables describing what all the positions do. Switch 2 here controls the method of swapping games. We want the game to change when we press the button, make the game reset when we press the button, but we don't want the game to change when we power cycle the Game Boy. This corresponds to mode 1 in the table, or both halves of Switch 2 in the off position. For the RAM and the ROM configuration, we have to set Switch 3. Remember for this game, we have two 2 megabyte ROMs, so that means I need to put Switch 3 into either mode A or C. If I had a 1 megabit SRAM chip, then mode A would split the RAM into four sections, and mode C would split it into two sections. But because I have a 256K SRAM chip, this only provides one section of RAM space total, so these modes are going to act the same. I'm going to put it in mode C to put both switches in the same position. So overall, this board is set to operate in mode 1C. Remember that you don't need these switches, you can bridge the pads with solder if you want to save money, because for whatever reason, these switches are a few dollars each. Now I do a bit of cleanup on the leftover flux, and a final inspection to check over all the joints. I use isopropyl alcohol to take care of the leftover flux, but I'm really careful not to get a lot on the board by the button, um, just in case any leaks into the membrane and causes intermittent connections. You'll also want to keep an eye out for any stray solder balls that might have been created from the solder paste. They can get in between pins and cause issues if you're not careful, so just look around the board for those and clean them up. Now we're ready to try and program the cart with our games, but first I'm going to use the GBX cart to dump the ROM files from my original Pokemon Gold and Silver cartridges to load onto the new board. To communicate with the GBX cart, I use software that's called Flash GBX. When you first connect to the GBX cart, just select the Game Boy mode, hit refresh, and the cart information should show up on the left. If you hit the backup ROM button, the GBX cart will dump the ROM file for you onto your computer. My Pokemon Silver still has the save data too, so I'll also make a copy of that by hitting backup save data. My gold version lost its battery a while ago, but I can still dump the ROM file. Now I plug in the multi-cart to start programming that. When I first connect to it, it should be completely blank on the left side. If it's not, then your EEPROM just had some leftover data. Um, but that's not a problem, just hit write ROM and it'll overwrite that. Some information about the cart should come up. It should read 4 megabyte ROM size and the cart type should be DIY cart with AM29F032 at audio. Just hit OK and then choose your first ROM file. It doesn't matter which ROM you pick to flash first, um, but once you do that, it'll take a few minutes to flash to the cartridge. And if you get any errors anywhere during this process, then you've got a problem somewhere on your cart that you'll need to figure out. 99% of the time that you get an issue with programming, the problem is usually the soldering on the cartridge somewhere. So before you go and blame any hardware or faulty chip, just check over your work, and you might just need to reflow some pins, usually on the EEPROM and the MBC chip, to get it to work. Once you've programmed one of the ROMs, just press the button in the middle of the cart to switch memory banks to the second ROM slot, then hit refresh on the Flash GBX software, and the information on the left should appear blank again. So go ahead and write your second ROM to the second ROM bank. One note here, uh, with Switch 2, if you're in mode 3 or 4, that's in that table on the GitHub, um, which lets you change games by resetting the cartridge, pressing the refresh button on Flash GBX will switch game slots too. So just be aware of that. As of this recording, Flash GBX doesn't encounter any issues programming games like this, but it might be beneficial to switch to modes one or two so that you have complete control over when the ROM banks change by pressing the button instead of relying on the reset. Then you can switch it back to mode three or four after you're done programming. 
Now that we have the games loaded onto the cart, we can try it out in a Game Boy to see if it operates correctly. I know some of this footage has shown the cart with the battery soldered in already, but that's just because I forgot to record some footage while I was going through it the first time. At this point in the process, the cart should still not have the battery or the crystal oscillator on it. Now because of this, the game won't be able to hold a save or any clock information after powering down, but we can create save data that will last as long as we keep the Game Boy powered on. So I'll start the game up in Pokemon Gold, make a new game, save it, and then press the button to switch games to Pokemon Silver without powering off the Game Boy, and check to make sure that we can still see the save data. Alright, it looks like everything is working as expected. If I wasn't able to see the save data, that would indicate a problem on the board somewhere. Likely this would be a bad solder joint or bridged pins somewhere on the RAM, the MBC3, or one of the parts U4 through U7. So now I'll go ahead and solder in the battery and the crystal oscillator. One last step before I finish up the build is to measure the battery current and make sure something isn't sucking up current from the battery that shouldn't be. But to get an accurate measurement, I first need to boot the game on a Game Boy after I solder in the battery. Once that's done, take the game out, flip it on its back, and use a multimeter in millivolts mode to measure the voltage across test point 2 and test point 3. For MBC3 multi-carts, you shouldn't be reading anything above 70 millivolts or so. And for MBC5 multi-carts, it shouldn't be any higher than about 20 millivolts. If you get something a lot higher than this, especially past 100 millivolts, you either have an error on the board somewhere, or you're pressing the button on the front to change games. Um, you want to make sure you're measuring this voltage without pressing that button. So all that's left now is to button it back up in a shell and add a sticker. I'm using a Cloud Game Store shell and a custom label from Matthew Mods on Etsy. He has a demonstration video linked in his store on how he applies stickers to carts to ensure that there aren't any air bubbles trapped and that everything lines up well. The general idea is to peel back a bit of the sticker backing and line up the edges of the cart and the sticker and slowly go back and forth over the sticker with your finger and press it down to force any air out as you go um, and then work your way up to the top of the sticker. And there we go. All right, now that we've finished all of that, we've got the final product, Pokemon Gold, Pokemon Silver, one cartridge with shared save data with a button inside that you can press to switch versions. Um, and I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons why you might want to have it like this is that you can catch uh, version exclusive Pokemon in one game um, without having to trade it to another version. Um, so this will really speed up completing the Pokédex. Obviously, there's still things like trade evolutions you have to worry about. Um, but otherwise, it's it's also just, you know, fun to play with. So here I've got Pokémon Silver version. Um, I used the GBX cart to load up my personal save file from my Pokémon Silver version, um, my original cartridge that I have. Um, so this is Pokémon Silver right now. So if I press the button, it'll reset and uh, should boot up Pokemon Gold. There you go. Um, and the save data is compatible between the two versions. As you can see, no issues here. Now if I turn off the, the Game Boy and turn it back on, it'll still be Pokemon Gold. But if you wanted to have it switch um, by doing that as well, um, or instead of using the button, you can configure the board to do that too. To close out this video, I just want to touch on one more feature of these boards, and that is the hot swap mode. Now this is something you might have already seen if you follow me on social media, or if you've read through the GitHub 
but basically hot swapping is when you change the game without resetting the Game Boy. And that's controlled by Switch 2 at the top here. Um, specifically, when we put it into Mode 2 from that table that I showed earlier. We configured it to reset the Game Boy whenever we press the button, um, but by putting the top switch of Switch 2 into the on position to the left, this will disable the reset from happening. This makes it so that you can change games on the fly without interrupting gameplay. Now for a lot of games, uh, or most games really, um, like Oracle of Seasons and Ages, that's not going to do anything other than crash the game, um, which isn't super helpful obviously. Uh, but for Pokemon Gold and Silver, or Red and Blue, um, since they share a lot of the same code, you can hot swap the games um, without many side effects, as long as you're not doing anything that's, you know, really dynamic, like walking around or in a battle. Um, so for here, I've, I'm in the gold version in Ilex Forest. So in Ilex Forest, in gold, you can get Caterpie and Metapod. And then in silver, you can get Weedle and Kakuna. So I've uh, started here in gold version. Found a Caterpie. Now, if I press the button on the back of the cart like this, I've just switched the games. So now I'm playing silver version. And you can see there wasn't any crashes or anything like that. Everything is still running normally. And I should get a Weedle or a Kakuna here. Yeah, there you go. So again, this mode's really only applicable to Pokemon games um, because the code between the versions is so similar. And even with Pokemon games, you can still run into glitches, especially if you're switching games. Um, like I said, while you're, you know, walking around or something's loading like that. Um, so you might get some really, you know, funky effects some really interesting glitches. You know, it's just part of the fun. It's it's fun to experiment with this and see what, see what you can do. So another uh, cartridge you can make with this multi-cart board is actually just a single game with an added reset button. You can do this by simply programming the same game to the cartridge twice and using a 256K RAM chip to keep one save file. Um, this could be helpful if you're playing Gen 2 games and you're trying to you know, hunt for shinies and you want a really quick way of resetting the game. Um, or maybe you want to have a single game with two separate save files Maybe you and your significant other really like using Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen Pocket Planner to keep track of your daily activities, store phone numbers, and play the drop and shop minigame, and you don't want to screw each other's save data up. I'm not here to judge you. Um, or maybe you want to have all four Gen 1 Pokemon games on one cartridge and have separate save data for all of them. Red, blue, yellow, and green are all one megabyte large, and the cartridge can hold up to four games totaling up to four megabytes, um, so that would be another option. There aren't endless possibilities, uh, but there are a lot of them. And again, this is all detailed on the GitHub. Um, and I really recommend you go read that if you haven't yet. And if you have any other questions, this video wasn't meant to, you know, be the only tutorial. It was just supposed to be a companion piece to that GitHub. Um, so if you have any lingering questions, they're probably answered there. And I know that GitHub is, <laughs> can be a fire hose of information trying to read all that. Um, but I did try to cover all my bases, and I do put a lot of work into it. So I would appreciate it if you checked that out, too. Um, so again, thank you for watching this. Um, hopefully it served as a good supplement, and hopefully it helped at least some people out there. Uh, but for now, it's time for me to go play some Baldur's Gate.